Welcome back. In the last part of this lecture, we introduce a new form of the Maxwell equation. It was differential, and it involved something called the upper convected time derivative, which allows our coordinate system to deform with a flow, and hence allows us to accurately track the deformation history of a set of Maxwell elements, polymer chains, and hence it allows us to calculate accurately the state of stress now in a fluid. What we're going to do in this part of this lecture is to continue our worked example for a simple shear flow. And we're going to see two things. We're going to see, first of all, that because we've reverted back to simple differential Maxwell, albeit in this convected form, we can no longer describe shear thinning in steady shear. We have not got something like the Wagner damping function to provide that nonlinearity for us. But what we will see is something really quite important. If you think back to the introduction to section B, there was a video that showed some very interesting viscoelastic flow phenomenon. Rod climbing, the Weissenberg effect, extradate swell, self-siphoning. And when we introduced these, we said, look, these are due to what we term normal stress differences. An unusual feature of polymeric liquids is their ability to develop stress in directions that are not related to the direction of deformation. So we might have a shear deformation, but not only will we get a stress in that deformation direction, but also in directions normal to that, so in the principal directions. And up till this point, we've been unable to capture that phenomenon. In fact, we haven't even discussed that phenomenon. Now, with the introduction of convected constitutive equations, we will see that that result naturally falls out of the formulation. So, let's see how we do this we're going to make an assumption of homogeneous steady shear flow. Now remember, homogeneous flows are ones where we can ignore v dot grad tau. v dot grad tau equals zero because our shear rate is the same everywhere. So we're going to say that my shear rate is gamma dot xy and it's simply partial du by dy. u is the x direction velocity, y is the y direction. So that is the only non-zero shear rate in my shear rate tensor. So we're going to start by writing out the full upper convected Maxwell model. There it is on the board. And we're going to examine this term by term. So we're going to start off with the shear rate tensor. I've highlighted it in blue on the board. Now, the lesson we're going to learn is that it is imperative to simplify your tensors before you start using them in any operations. So by means of an example, let's remind ourselves what the shear rate tensor looks like. Here it is. Gamma dot equals grad V plus grad V transpose. Nice and symmetric. And it's got these nine terms in. So if our only shear direction is gamma dot XY, which is equal to du by dy, we don't need this full form. We can simplify this tensor very greatly because most of its entries are zero. We've now crossed out all the zero terms and just left those terms that are non-zero, partial du by partial dy, and we can see that that exists in two positions because of symmetry. So our shear rate tensor is really quite compact. Gamma dot tensor equals gamma dot xy multiplied by that tensor there, which has just got two non-zero entries. So that makes it a lot more easy to manipulate. OK, the next tensor we're going to look at is the stress tensor, which I've highlighted in orange. Now, there on the board, I've written out the full form of the stress tensor, all of its nine terms present. Now, remember what we said about capturing normal forces. What we're going to do is to set a smaller number of terms in the stress tensor to zero. We're going to keep non-zero terms that are in the same direction as the deformation rate, so tau xy, but also elect to keep all the principal stresses non-zero, so tau xx, tau yy, and tau zz. We're going to keep because we are looking for the ability of these convected constitutive equations to model normal stresses. So there is a simplified form now of my stress tensor. It keeps the three principal stresses plus tau xy because that is the deformation direction, as we can see in our rate of strain tensor. 
So, there's my stress tensor. I'm now going to examine that total time derivative of my stress tensor, big D by big DT of tau. I've highlighted it there in pink. Now, the aim of putting this back on the board is a reminder. A reminder that homogeneous flows have the second term of this total derivative zero by definition. So V dot grad tau equals zero because of flow homogeneity. Hooray, this is good. We don't have to deal with that third rank tensor. There are situations where you do, but we're not going to cover them in this course. So what this leads us to is a simpler expression for what the tensorial form of big D by big DT of tau is. And it's just a partial time derivative of tau. There we go. Partial D by partial DT of the stress tensor, which I've already defined. So we're happy with that. Nice and simple. The next thing we're going to look at is the first of these two terms within the curly brackets. Now, remember in the last part of this lecture, we said that the sum of the two terms in these curly brackets will be a symmetric entity. So hopefully when we examine this term and then the other term adjacent to it and add them together, we will see that symmetry is maintained. So let's write this out in full. So there on the board now, the left hand side, that's grad V transpose. It's my tensor of velocity gradients. It's not symmetric because it's just one grad V. And that's dot producted with my stress tensor. Now, rule number one, always simplify. So I'm going to set those terms to zero that are zero and only keep those terms that are non-zero and then perform my dot product. Far, far quicker, far, far easier. And we will see that the dot product results in two non-zero terms in the 1, 1 and the 1, 2 position of that tensor, partial du by partial dy of tau yx, and in the 1, 2 position, partial du by partial dy of tau yy. Hopefully, we will see that when we look at the next term in those curly braces, we'll simply end up with a transpose of this tensor as the result to maintain symmetry. So let's do that. So I'm looking at the term highlighted in blue now, and on the left hand side I have my stress tensor, on the right hand side I have grad V. Rule number one, get rid of the terms that are zero. So I'm going to rule out those terms, quite a lot of them. I'm going to perform the dot product and again we can see it is the transpose of the term we just looked at. So good, so adding those two terms together, the term in yellow and the term in blue, results in a symmetric entity which therefore ensures that our stress tensor doesn't break symmetry. So that's all the terms in the upper convected Maxwell equation simplified and multiplied out. So what we're going to do now is to write the upper convected Maxwell equation in the form that is specific to our problem with all the tensors expanded out. So there on the board on the second line is the tensor equation that we're dealing with. When it's written out like this, we can see, hopefully clearly, that this allows us up to nine equations in parallel to be written, which is why we simplify first, because there are only four remaining now, and two of those are zero. So let's examine that formally. I'm going to go through the elements of each tensor and create an equation by comparing the same position in each of those tensors. So let's have a look at the 1-1 one, one position. We can see on the left hand side, the 1, 1 position of gamma dot is zero. On the right hand side, that tensor in pink, which is the total derivative of the stress tensor, we have a partial d by partial dt of tau xx. So that's non-zero, that's good. In the second tensor on the right hand side, which is a sum of the grad v transpose dot tau plus tau dot grad v, uh, that symmetric entity, we can see the 1, 1 position has 2 tau yx. And in the final tensor, tau, we can see the 1, 1 position is just tau xx. And so we end up with the equation that I've highlighted there in blue with a big blue box. And on the left hand side, we have that zero. And on the right hand side, we have a sum of terms that drop out of those tensors. So we're going to do the same now for the 1, 2 position. The left hand side is now non-zero. And you can see where the terms originate from on the right hand side because I've put purple boxes around them. 
and we end up with that equation that I've also shown in a purple box. OK, we've got two more equations to look at. Let's have a look at the 2, 2 position. The left hand side is 0. The right hand side only involves tau y, y, both as a partial time derivative coming from big D by big DT of tau, and also by itself because of the virtue of the stress tensor also being on the right hand side there in orange. And hopefully we can see immediately that tau y, y is actually 0. One equation left, and this is a 3, 3 position. Left hand side, it's equal to 0. Right hand side, very similar to the form that we derived for the 2, 2 position. And again, we can see that tau zz is therefore 0. So, with our upper convected Maxwell equation written in a form specific to this problem, with all the tensors neatly simplified, we have four equations that drop out, two of which result in zero stress. So tau yy is zero, tau zz is zero, perhaps implying that tau xx isn't zero. And this is a new result because tau xx is the normal stress in the x face in the x direction, which is otherwise absent from the Maxwell equation written in, in simple differential or simple integral form. More on this in the next part of this lecture. So let's examine a few key points. We've looked at a flow scenario that involves homogeneous steady shear flow. That homogeneous flow definition allows us to say that v dot grad t equals zero. We don't have to worry about formulating grad t, grad tau, which is a third rank tensor. We've seen that it is very advantageous to simplify tensors before you operate on them. So I'll say always simplify those tensors before you use them. The result of examining this equation has now resulted in two non-zero PDEs to solve, which is what we'll do in the next part of this lecture.